Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Dr. Dad's Podcast. I'm here with my, my co-doctor dad, Dr. David Gordy. How are you today, buddy? I'm amazing, man. I just got out of the gym, so I feel groovy oh. smoothie right now. That's why you're late? Because you went to the gym. Nice. <laughs> so, bud, <laughs> let me tell you how my Tuesdays go real quick. And I want my the patients or listeners, patients, doctors, whoever's listening. Everybody, this yeah. is, everybody can relate to this. Time is an asset, right? Like, yeah. and we're, we're always trying to fit things in. I mean, you and me talk about grease in the groove. And so for everybody, I, I boxed Nick earlier today, right after I got out of the office, I said, hey, brother, you might be on like 10, 15 minutes late. Got a lot going on today. I got to try to fit it in. So just the last two weeks, I haven't been able to get in the gym like I need to, the consistency I need to. So I had like a 30-minute window today. So like I left work, ran to the bank, filled my truck with gas, came home, changed, ran to the gym. Got like a solid workout in 30 minutes, ran back. I was only 10 minutes late, brother. So I Dude, think that was pretty good. That was amazing. So I got a lot done today. But in all honesty, I was in a place today where I was like, this is priority. Like I have not been in the gym like I need to the last two weeks. I need to get back on track. So I made it a priority. And like how many times, because we're going to talk about things like this today, but how many times do we default to, oh, I don't have enough time? Yep. So then we just like, cancel it out and it's usually things like self-care that get the boot right because we got this thing to do and this thing comes up and that comes up and then before you know it if you don't get back on track and get back on that horse all of a sudden there's like a month pass and you're like oh shit like i haven't been doing this when i was being consistent and all of a sudden it's gone i mean when you're living a fast pace like you and me do between the clinic and family and you know everything like that the consistency of the habit is i think the juice yeah. And I've, I have found that I'd rather do 15 to 30 minutes of something than just to say, oh, like I couldn't fit it in today. So I'll just like skip it. Cause that habitual just doing something keeps me on it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I had to get the gym fitted in day, man. So got to the gym, got over here and yeah, it was on time. I love that that's why you were a little bit late, you know, because it wasn't like someone else was dictating your time. Cause I've been late before because I've, elongated a visit or if you know someone's a little bit late and so i i you know sort of give some of my time like time is such an important commodity and i and and i love that you made the priority based on your own terms to 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 take care of yourself man like that's that's amazing isn't it funny how like we're almost like feel bad about I don't I don't don't think that I heard that in your voice, but it's it's common where we may feel bad or guilty that hey, I did something for myself. That's why I push things a little bit behind. Like that that should be the most important thing. Like, hey, I took care of myself. Right. So I, I made that the priority. And so, you know, I'm gonna show up a little bit late. Everything's gonna be cool anyways, but it wasn't like you chose something where you went unconscious or like you let someone dictate your time. Like you you made it happen. So I, yeah, I love that because that's literally what we're going to be talking about today, isn't it? Well, it's huge, right? I mean, if I don't do this for me, it influences so many things, right? And the like, people around you. And the people right? around me. And I know I'm a better version of myself if I can get in the gym at a consistent frequency throughout the week. Period. There's no argument with it. Yeah. It has nothing to do with, like, the physical part of me. That's one of the benefits. But, like, I'm just a better person, man. Like, <laughs> And like my brain works better. I'm in a better mood. I sleep better. I feel better at work. I'm, I feel better on my feet all day. And so it's just something that, you know, the older I get, the more I'm like, this can't be something that is thrown to the side. Like it has to be an essential part of, of my week. And even like to days today, I got to find ways to get in. But I've even jumped off with you before on our podcast, done 15 minutes of something, and then I have to run the Diego to martial arts. So mm-hmm. like, it's just something, right? I mean, Little bits pay off, and that's that's the key for everybody who's listening. It doesn't have to be an hour at the gym. It doesn't have to be a full hour of anything. If all you have 15 minutes a day and that's you do that consistently throughout the week, I mean that's going to make big changes. Um, It's just the habit piece of it. So 
Yeah. Yeah. So totally. So apologize so that, for the tardiness, man. But like, no, man. that that's what was going on today. It was a teachable moment, is exactly it what it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, what what we were going to talk about today, and how it relates to this this conversation, is I don't know how many times in a week you you meet someone who's just a, a non-starter. You know, like I'm feeling the depression, the pain, the lethargy, the fatigue, um, less than myself, a different version of myself, the uh, an attachment to an old identity that feels like it can never capture again. You know, this idea that just to start something would would take such monumental effort to move out of the discomfort. And a lot oftentimes these people are really intelligent. They they know quote unquote what they should do. Right. They they know they maybe they've seen you before. They know what you're going to be telling them. They know sort of the plan. Yet to actually start requires so much effort that they just can't. Let's talk about that individual because that's a common one. Well this is suffering, right? And the longer we're in suffering the harder it becomes, the more deep you fall into this this abyss and the more resistance there is, like you're saying, to become motivated and have any kind of motivation to make the better choice um, and to just get moving. You know, I put a post on my Instagram the other day and it said, um, what does it say? It said, uh, let me read, I don't want to get it wrong, so let me read it to you. And we talked about this last time, but this is a prime example of this and, and when you really think about the way our brain functions, the mind, and the state that we're in, that state determines the choices you make and how you think yeah. and how you're going to problem solve. And all these things come with that state. So when you're in what Nick's describing and you're in the suffering, yeah, it's not necessarily you. It's not a trait. It's just a state that's making you be stuck in this. So errors are due to state, not trait. And this, mm -hmm. it's no different with what we're talking about. When you're in a state like that, there's a whole onslaught of change in your brain chemistry. And even if you want to, like you're saying, and you know you're intelligent, you know I need to do this, and I need to take this step. And if I do these steps, I know I'll pull myself out of it. The amount of resistance that is there is is monumental sometimes yeah. because of where you're at. I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, I've been there in my life. I've watched practice members go through this. I've watched my wife go, go through this with her health. You know, I, we've all watched other people experience this in life. But what I want the listeners to understand, what I really want to get into today, is the chemistry of what's happening and understanding methods and practices that you can do to start moving that needle to allow yourself to start making leeway to get back to where you need to get because sometimes it's just baby steps needed you just need to make the baby step you get well, i think it's step. essential I think yeah it's, it's just that little mini step from where yeah. you're at and then you do it again and there, even if it's little baby mini steps yeah and we'll talk about the chemistry there those reward centers, those dopamine, dopaminergic reward centers start to get stimulated and then it motivates and changes the chemistry in the brain to do more and more and more. But it's just taking the baby step sometimes. Yeah. yeah. You know? So, yeah. So I, I think I think where a lot of people get stuck too in, in, is in, in the mindset in regarding an identity. Because there's, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens as we age and I've experienced it a few times over the past year. Uh, where I've had some lingering pain that that I've chosen or I've, I've reciprocated my mind uh, a play like a, it's like someone's press play in my my brain to say that wow well, you, you're getting a little bit older you're starting to feel some some aches and pains right it's like a, a paradigm or, or an automatic tape that plays um, and then that creates that's reinforcing this identity that's that, that's currently the problem. But I think so much of us or so many people get stuck in this old identity of like, well, when I was 20 or 30 or whatever, I used to be able to do this and this and this. I want to go back there. And I think that also gets us into a trap because we want to go back in time to a time that we can never necessarily recapture. We can't go back in time. We can interpret you know, differently what happened in the past. But we really have to bring ourselves to the present of like, this is what's going on. This is what I'm dealing with. And I can create a new identity 
you know, I can, I can be someone who can move out of pain, move out of suffering. I can do all those things, but this is almost like a bit of a believing it before you see it kind of phenomenon. But what do you see as a challenge for people to uh, choose an identity and then make that part of the driving force? Because I feel it's absolutely essential. I, I don't see how we can actually move beyond our pain if we, all we see is the pain. You know, when we see the symptom and we live in the symptom, live in the suffering, it's really hard to choose a new identity for ourselves. But what comes up for you in, in, in that kind of dialogue? I love that you brought this up because I was literally rewriting some of my initial paperwork in my clinic for my practice members to read through this exact thing that you just mentioned. Nice. This is cool. So pain. When we experience pain, whether it's physical pain, mental, emotional pain, whatever, this is an indicator that you need to make a change. And like what Nick's talking to as far as identity, I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a practice member today. She lost her husband like, I want to say six, eight months ago. So she's been going through the grieving process. And she was very, very close to her husband is one of those couples where like they were just best friends and like those, they spent all their time together. Like she didn't hang out a ton with other friends and stuff. Her husband was the, her best friend. So I mean, when you lose your best friend of, I don't know how long they were married, 60, 70 years, there's a big identity shift there. Yeah, nice. there really is. I mean, think about that. I mean, part of your identity was that partner with you by your side and everything you do in life. Is, is, is existing with this person and then all of a sudden they're gone mm -hmm. so like you're saying she can't go to the past because he's not present anymore so how can she try to identify with the old her and that's actually where she was stuck and I, I talked to her today I said look you know we were doing some NIS stuff and we talked about this in the last episode the mental stress and two layers came up on her the first one was panic and then the second one on her was grieving and she was surprised because she thought it was going to be grieving. And when I told her panic, she kind of looked at me. Mm -hmm. So then we just kind of talked about why panic would be showing. And the reality for her is exactly what we're talking about. She is in an identity crisis right now. Yeah. And she's in panic mode. She is still grieving in the background, but she doesn't have conscious control of the panic. So she's in this alarm state with her nervous system 24-7 in chronic stress. And it's because... She keeps living in the past. And until she can, and I had to reframe her today and explain to her, I said, look, and it's funny, like you said, they're intelligent people. They know what they need to oh, do. Yeah. yeah. And so I told her, I said, moving forward, you cannot be the same person that you were when your husband was alive. And she looked right at me and she looked me right in the eyes immediately. And she says, I know. And then she got all choked up and she started crying. And I told her, I said, look, there is a whole other part of you that's already there that needs to be expressed and developed. And it's not like you need to go looking for it outward in life. You need to look for this inward. And I said, when you find it, you're going to, that's what you're going to start creating anew. And that's what's going to shift you through this panic and to help you through the grieving process. But I just had to reframe it and she had to see it. Right. And so sometimes I think even visually taking people through these exercises when it's an emotional thing with an identity, yeah. you're able to shift them in the moment. They can have that moment of insight, right? Um, they, be, they, they gain the awareness and then they can move into that acceptance, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's sometimes someone just needs to say it a certain way. But the moment they can do that, and if I got her to take that baby step to move through her pain now and start to move into creation versus living in the past like we talked, Yep. I'm already helping her move in the direction that she needs to go, right? And I'm not a psychiatrist and, and stuff like that. This is just practical, psych, what do they call it, practical psychology or psychiatry. This, but, is just, this is just what happens when you work with David, actually. <laughs> it's called magic, too. <laughs> but I love it that you brought this up because it, it, that's, that's exactly what I experienced today. And I, today was one of those days where I had multiple patients that needed emotional work. But it was also the same and I don't want to take up too much time, but had another patient come in, father, daughter, daughter's in her early twenties, daughter's ready to move into, I don't, I know what I'm doing. Parents don't know what they're talking about. Let me make my own decisions. Dad's having a hard time letting go, right? Allowing child in her early twenties to start making these decisions. 
And what was interesting about that, and the one part I wanted to hit on this, was he's in emotional pain, and he's having a really hard time dealing with this sadness of his daughter basically is like, I want to do my own thing. I want to make my own decisions. You just have to respect that at this point now, right? Yeah. And then deal with it. And he's trying to be the best dad he can by accepting it. But what's happening with him is he's in his head, logically trying to do this instead of his heart. And so the conversation with him today was, buddy, that decision and that shift in your life cannot be made from your brain, from the mind, from a logical place. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is something that is a heart-centered problem that needs to be fixed in the heart. And for him, vulnerability is needed to allow himself to say, okay, I don't love my, any, my daughter any less by allowing her to move into early adulthood and make her own decisions. Because I think as a parent, we can struggle with this, this dynamic of, if I don't do these things and guide her and tell her it has to be done this way, I'm not being a good parent. Mm -hmm. I'm not being a good dad. I'm not doing my job. Yeah. But in reality, there's a point in life, I think, with our kids where we have to back off and they have to make their own decisions and we have to sit and watch them make these mistakes. And especially in our in our 20s, right? You remember your 20s. Yeah, so I don't want to take up much more time so we can get in. But, love it. It's, but it's interesting, right? Like even knowing where to deal with the problem yeah. can move us through this identity crisis. Because that, that the same, the, the father-daughter, that's an identity thing too. It's yeah. a, like how, it's what he sees himself as dad and how he has to show up. Mm -hmm. And that has to evolve now, and he's having a hard time doing it from a logical place. And it can't be done there. Yeah. Those are two brilliant examples. Uh, and one thing, like theme, that I think we all at some point in time need to come to reconciliation with is change is the constant. Like with life, it's just that is the constant. How can we reconcile that change will always be there? You know, and I'm already grieving that conversation with with my boys, knowing that that day is going to come. Um, you know, that's that's part of life, though. And so, you know, this grieving process, this this attachment to to controlling and trying to limit the amount of change that happens, is also where we get we get lost in our identity. And there's no easy solution, I think, for reconciling change. It's 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 just it's built into life. It's kind of like gravity. It's like you can't get mad that you throw an apple near is gonna fall. It's yeah. just it's a reality of life as is as is change. And and if we truly adopted that concept, we could also recognize that the symptoms, the the current situation that we're in, you know, how challenging all the suffering that we're in, you know, maybe we lost someone this too will pass, right? Like this is going to change as well. It's just the heaviness of that moment gets wrapped up in this identity that we now, you know, have adopted. And we've, we've decided, you know, maybe consciously or unconsciously that this is who we are. And so this is how we interpret life. And uh, that's sticky. It's, it's, <laughs> That doesn't involve change. That involves like uh, changes happening around you, but you're choosing not to change. Right. right. You want to hold on to it. Well, and buddy, there's so many different levels of what you're speaking to. I mean, there are people that something happens in an instant in their life and it completely changes everything. Mm -hmm. You know, a good series for our listeners, if you haven't seen it on Disney Plus, is that well, that new series with Chris Hemsworth called Limitless. Mm. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, buddy, you have to check it out. It's awesome. Yeah. Like, wow. He goes through all these longevity like things that he sh and they explain the science and break down the physiology of why you would do something like that. And he's meeting with like longevity doctors and like psych psychology mindset doctors, and they're explaining and showing how he handles stress and how breath work works and how his mindset needs to change and and how he reframes things. They do fasting, they do cryotherapy, uh, hot, you know, like sauna therapy, high sauna therapy, like high heat. They go into the, the interesting part of this one was the very last episode. He works with a doctor that helps people basically learn how to reconcile with death and mm -hmm. understanding that death is part of life and it's not something that we should. It's not something that we should resist. And when we resist death that can be more of a health crisis for you than actually just accepting that it's part of life yeah beautiful episode the last episode of that series but the guy that takes him through this that's a doctor very gifted he had one of those moments in life where like instant to instantly life changed and you see so many people that things like this happens to them right they have a stroke um 
Yeah. They have a heart attack, they have a seizure, and then they're they're left permanently handicapped or they're in an accident, right? And some of these people stay in the suffering for decades because they were not willing to let that other person die, mm -hmm. which is themselves. And that's literally what that doctor explained. He said it took two years of me like being in that and trying to realize. And then he's like, and then one day I just had to let him die. I had to let the old me die. And I had to say, this is just me moving forward. And he healed the moment he did that. The moment yeah. he had that awareness and acceptance of, you know, this has to happen. So, I mean, it's just what we're talking to. There's this creation aspect versus reaction. And the problem is when we're stuck in this state, like we're talking, very people are very reactive. But it's almost like you're on autopilot. And if you're not, if you don't have conscious control to get yourself out of this, then it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost like they're they're living their death over and over and over and over again and not yeah. recognizing that the, you've just planted seeds for change and, and this new identity, right? There's, yeah. a, there's a stoic quote called, a, or phrase or whatever called memento mori, which is uh, meditating on your death or remembering that we're mortal. And, uh, you know, <laughs> even just looking at the last couple of years, the, the amount of fear around death and change and transformation and tran transmutation too because like you know people literally had to pivot every aspect of their life and unfortunately there's you know a huge amount of people that didn't transition or didn't pivot and they, they ended up you know suicide or overdose or you know the mental health crisis that they were uh no doubt dealing with or stuck in for many years and then a, a crisis shifted things for them in a big way but you know this idea that, that can we contemplate that we're only going to be here for a short period of time and that how can we be more present? I mean, it's kind of like the simple answer of being with ourself, with our consciousness right now in this moment. And can we appreciate that so deeply that we're choosing to be our best in this moment? And for some who feel like they just can't get off the chair or whatever that metaphorical stuckness is to, to get on the mat, to go for a walk, to put the right food on in front of you, you know, if, if we really adopted this idea that, that this is the only moment that exists right now, memento mori, that, that we will die at some point, today could be our last day, would we choose this moment differently? Would we give our kids that slightly longer hug and look them in the eye or you know kiss our loved ones just more deeply because we recognize that, shit, this is all that there is, is right now, right? Well, and what I want to leave people with too is, and this was said in that series and it really hit home and we all know these things, but life hangs on by a breath. I mean, when you're, I mean, if, if you've, if you've ever been in a room with, with somebody who's passed and I haven't, mm. but I know people who have, and they talk to me about it. Yeah. They're like, it's just in an instant and it's gone. They're gone. And there's a stillness and they're gone, but it literally is hanging on by a breath. The funny thing is, is, we all go to bed every night thinking we're going to live a long life mm -hmm. and that that's far away. Yeah. And the reality is, no, it's not. It's not as far as you think it is. And the other reality is that you're not guaranteed the next day. Mm -hmm. You're not guaranteed the next 10 minutes. Things happen. So yeah. like Nick's saying this mortality piece of finding peace and doing meditations, like they have death doulas and they have people that take you through these medita mortality meditations, is to find that fragility of life, like you're saying, and then also the contrast with death. But there's, a, there's an acceptance there, and it can be very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then you, you move into life, like you're saying, you're saying like squeezing your kids or you know, hugging them harder, longer, kissing your wife more intensely with love and finding better connection. It helps you show up, right? And just squeezing all that juice that's always there every day, but you're just not seeing it because yeah. you're, you don't have that conscious control of it, right? And so, yeah, it's interesting, man. I'm 40 now and death has started this new theme in my life, mm -hmm. you know, but I want to be in a place, you know, where i'm just when it happens i'm good i'm at peace like you know what i mean yeah and i can say like I've, I've, i'm living every day to to its fullest and i don't have any regrets you know like that mm -hmm. but talk about identity man i mean death death there's a different identity of death with everybody 
Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so and, true. And, and, you know, I can't but think that, you know, the amount of suffering that we're experiencing right now, again, so wrapped up in this old version of ourselves or like this future, like I should be like this, you know, or I used to be like that, like so wrapped up in this other than now identity that it's no doubt a significant part of perpetuating the state of suffering. So, so I, I think like, I mean, you're tearing me up hearing you speak because it, I mean, this is the, probably the most important conversation that anyone could have with themselves. And so I'm, I'm so grateful to be able having this conversation with you. And, you know, this is kind of the, the joy of podcasting. We never really know, you know, how, where, where what direction the things are going to go in. But so let's say that this is a foundational piece which I, I fully agree that it is. Now let's let's talk about sort of another layer to this because there's so many different lenses through which we could talk about, you know, this, this non-starting, this in, incapacity to move beyond the suffering of the moment that we find ourselves in. Um, I mean, you look through the lens of the neurological system, just like I do with, with brain mapping neurofeedback, but like, let's talk about this neurological stuckness that, that can also be a manifestation for us. Okay, so, oh man, <laughs> so break you it got down. ten minutes. Go. <laughs> no, but, but give me a start. There. Like, where do you, where do you want to go with this? Like, yeah, well, well, I think like you know, we were we were before we were sort of fleshing out what we were going to discuss today. We were talking a little bit about the the biochemistry. That, so looking okay. at the lens of dopamine. Yeah. So but maybe above that. that would be the neurology. Whatever you want to say on that. Well, no, let's talk about dopamine because I think that's just a good a good point. So I was listening to the Huberman Lab and Jordan Peterson before I went to master's for NIS, and the conversation was about this dopaminergic reward center and how norepinephrine is a precursor to this. And when you find people that are, like, there's two sides of this. You have people that are on this, like, completely alarmed state. They're overstimulated. They're ang- anxious all the time. And then on the other end, you have people that are depressed and they're way too far parasympathetic and they're just down all the time, right? And they have no motivation to do anything. So you have these two opposite ends and everything in between. And then there's like this hinge in the middle, like a seesaw, where we constantly swing. And when we get in these states like we're talking about, it's like that seesaw is completely tilted and it's been tilted way too long. And you've, you've deepened your dive into either the parasympathetic or the sympathetic alarm state or calm state. So what's interesting about our brains is let's say, let's say I'm depressed and let's say I've been there for months and I've lost my motivation to like basic things to take care of myself. I don't eat right anymore. I'm not exercising. I'm not socializing with people. I don't even want to get up to make dinner for my family or, I mean, some people it's so bad that they don't even get up to even want to like set the table. Like it's, they're like unmotivated to do anything. What's happening in the brain from a chemistry standpoint is every time, every time we do a task, for example. So like, let's say an example he gave was I get up, I have a cup of coffee, I drink it, I wash the the coffee mug after I'm done and I, I dry it and then I put it back in the cabinet. That full loop that I just took and completed a task actually causes a dopamine hit in the brain. Okay. Similar things like when people do a post on social media and then like they want to see likes hit their mm-hmm. post, they're getting little dopamine hits. There's like this the in loop of a, of, a, of a circuit. So all day long, when we do incomplete tasks, we're getting these micro hits of dopamine, which is that's the reward center just feeding the brain and saying, hey, like that was good. And, it, and that's actually what helps motivate us to do more and more of these things. But people that are on this far end of depression there's like nothing hitting that center. And because they're so down, they don't even have the motivation to get up and finish a full loop of anything. Mm-hmm. So like some of those people have to be taken to where like you just have them do small little hits like I'm talking to start changing the chemistry. So our, my way I explain this to people is progress, not perfection. Nobody's going to make a 180 turn when you're in a state like that. Yeah. But if you make small baby steps... Even if it's like, okay, today I'm going to eat one one of my meals, I'll eat a healthy meal, and then the other ones I'll still keep eating bad. That's already a win because yeah. you change that one meal that day. And then the next day, maybe you change just one meal. And then it turns into two meals. 
And so there's these like micro steps sometimes that we need to take or even exercise. Maybe you just go out and you walk for five minutes mm -hmm. and you come back home. That's all you did. Still win because you completed a task. And I'm talking real severe here when like people are really, really dumb. Yeah. So, but that same so message can apply when we're like, we've been doing the right things and then we're sort of like in a, in a funky pattern for like a couple of weeks. It's yeah. just like find that one little thing that, that you can do. Yeah. So let me kind of bring it full circle of like why we get stuck where that, where that dopamine is not working real well. Norepinephrine is a precursor to dopamine. So for people that don't know what that is, norepinephrine is basically like speed. Our body dumps this out to respond to stress. Okay. So if I'm in stress too long, a chronic state of stress, basically I can exhaust and not actually make enough of this norepinephrine and I'm in the dumps. Some people are in the dumps, like I talked, and then some people there's too much. But if I'm in the dumps, I don't even have enough of that hormone to actually have enough juice to give me that dopamine hit. You see how that works? And then on the other end, when people are over anxious, there's way too much of this stuff floating through, right? And they're so overly stimulated with it, it's throwing them on the other end. So our hormones literally are backing up this master system, our brain, all day long to help us keep this balance. But when we tilt that seesaw too far one way or another and we stay there too long, that's where this stuff gets really jacked up and cause lots of problems. And like what Nick's saying is like there's no motivation to do anything. Right? Or on the other end, you can't even, there's just so much stimulation going on, you can't focus on one thing. Right, you're overstimulated all day. So, as far as chemistry, I, I think that's what you're asking me to break down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and there's some interesting stuff with um, norepinephrine too. That uh, like the, it has to do with like long-term memory retrieval, and it it helps with creativity and things like that. So, so sometimes like you know, this is a good example of like there's a good stress that's involved. Like I, I get hits of uh, dopamine when I learn something new, and like oh, like a connection is made. Right. And there's there's so many little chemistry, you know, call it the chemistry of bliss, like this this opportunity for this mixing of chemicals that that create new new, new connections that stimulate learning that that you know fulfill that reward loop that that happen and and I think for some of us we're not interpreting um, the reward either. Like we're also so stuck that we can't actually see the reward. We can't actually see that, oh, I completed a task like that. I made my bed. That's a, that's a task completion. I slept, I woke up, I made my bed. Like, wow, that's a tiny little reward, but it's a big one. I can't remember what a uh, general or something gave this amazing speech where it was all about like, make your bed, like just do the, do the, do the thing. That, that we're not we're we're not wanting to do, and so sometimes for people that are so stuck, it's just to your point, bringing in these really simple little baby steps to like just encourage a bit of a routine, and that you know you're going to get a reward. Like I always feel better when I make the bed. I look at the bed, you know, the pillows are you know displaced, and the the sheets are out. like I'm gonna have to like we've got these weighted blankets, so it's sort of annoying to make the bed because you pull back the weighted blanket and then you put it down nice and hospital corners, all that stuff. But then when you look at the bed after, you're like, man, like that's a nice bed. I can't wait to go in there again. Uh -huh. So, you know, like little things like that. But but I love I love looking at things through the, the neurotransmitter point of view. I find it fascinating. And like, I think also like the way that we started this conversation, it's really easy to like get very heady. Like David and I love the cerebral stimulation. Like we're getting rewarded just like listening to each other, you know, share this content. And there's also this, this heart focus of like this identity piece. And I think that there's an opportunity to really, you know, support both centers in a big, big way. And we have to find uniquely what stimulates our creativity, which stimulates our pathways, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I want to kind of jump off that comment of just to kind of bring it full circle now of like this, this heart brain connection, right? Yeah. So like earlier, we were talking about that, that practice member who was trying to make a shift in his identity from a headspace when it's never going to happen. And that's literally what I told him. I was like, buddy, mm -hmm. you're looking for a logical way of fixing this and making sense to yourself. And it's never going to happen up here. Yeah. Never. You'll be there forever. It's like, it's going to come from, from here, from the heart. 
That's where that decision needs to change. That's where that shift needs to change. So when we're talking about this motivation, these people that get stuck and they, we can't even just get them jump started. You need to deal with this all the time. I mean, when we have people that are very ill and sick and aren't well and they come into us, they're, they're in the, they're in the, they're in the, I don't want to say a negative way, but they're, they're at the bottom of the barrel, man. Like they're struggling. So th there's no motivation there. That's why they're coming to you. They need help. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because there's no space there at that time and place a lot of times for them to make a big shift. So what do you and me do all the time? It's baby steps with little things that start to move the needle. Yeah. And then the motivation increases slowly. So there's no way to fix this 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. You can't, right? Like, do you know of anything that can shift somebody that fast? I mean, there's some powerful things. Well, I there's, know. there's state changes, which you talked yeah. about at the beginning. Like that's NLP, different, right? Yeah, yeah, you can reframe yeah. people. EMDR, I mean, yeah, breath, all that and stuff. And the yeah. shift will take place because your perception changes, Yeah, but it's still going to take time for that yeah. chemistry to start changing in the body. But what I, what I love talking about healing all the time and talking to that point with reframing, you can change somebody's nervous system in an instant yeah. by using something like NLP or NIS or some of these techniques. But it takes time once that change is made for the chemistry in the body to catch up. Um, we talk about this all the time, right? Like dietary changes will make changes, but it takes time, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there's other things that are instantaneous. Neurofeedback, almost instantaneous, starts making changes. But again, the chemistry has to catch up in the body, right? The energy is changing, but the chemistry follows that, right? Follows that energy. Yeah. So coming back to this heart-brain connection... If we're in the wrong place, right, trying to deal with this stuff all the time, you're going to get stuck. You know, and a big part of, of healing is heart-centered focus. It's not logical stuff. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people, when they're not well, they're up in their head too much. And they, they're not where they need to be. And so for that full, full shift to take place to help people get motivated, there's a, there's a heart component there. That that is very overlooked, I believe, and and a lot of medicine, man, a lot yeah. of medicine. Well, that, you know, you look at all the the ancient medicine from shamanic to, you know, even if someone's doing you know psychedelic journeys or what have you, like there's just this integration that that's happening in a big way. There's there's a there's a quote that I think about often in regards to this. It, it's a it's a stoic quote as well. I think it's Seneca or what, one of those one of those guys, but it was. Is that don't tell me how many books you've read on a particular subject or don't tell me you've read the book. Tell me how your thinking has changed as a result of, you know, going through your experience. And like, really, that's what we're talking about is like, how have you changed your thinking, your behaviors? Like, that's the learning. It's not that you read something or you listened to the podcast or like, but how has your behavior changed? How's your thinking changed? Not even just your actions, but you have literally become a new person as a result of like truly learning. It's sort of like uh, Yoda says, there's no try, there's only do. It's like we get to see that transformation in how we've interpreted our, our new state, right? I think it's, uh -huh. it's a beautiful way to look at our graduation through something because we can, you know, hit the gym, we can eat the right food and all those things. But until we've actually started to see ourselves differently, and, and that may bring us back to that original conversation, with you, which is, can you be here in this moment? Can you appreciate the uh, our our mortality that, that this could be our last moment and and like can we be here in that uh -huh. that experience so uh, you know i love that you brought that up just around like we can change in a moment but it may take like a lifetime to actually uh realize that moment and that's where that that behavioral uh -huh. thinking change really comes into play well we had that what was his name the moment of insight guy oh yeah yeah spark or is it park of insight or Moment of, maybe it was moment of insight. Moment of insight. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't remember his name, but we talked about this, right? The guy's a psychologist, right? Yeah. Or psychiatrist. Child, child and, psychologist. Yeah. And he said he'd work with people for sometimes months or years, and then it mm -hmm. was just one session, one thing that he said or they said, mm -hmm. and it like changed, it completely yeah. changed for them, and like they didn't need therapy anymore, like they were done. Yeah. And that we have all experienced this through life. You know, I, I want to tell one more story because it seems like the theme of the week. I'm telling you, they come mm. in waves. <laughs> so I another patient. She moved to El Paso from Seattle, and 
she's working in a new job here and she's been here a while new to el paso so i mean coming to a place that far of a shift you know like seattle to el paso that can be a big change right and when she came into me she i could just tell she was in a lot of suffering but a lot of it was just dealing with this adaption to moving to a new place and having a new job and and what's played out throughout our process is this she has a she knows that there needs to be an evolution and a growth of herself and the way that she looks at things. But like we're talking, you can read all these books, you can listen to all these podcasts, but until you're actually implementing these things and making changes, nothing changes for you. So we were, we were talking about one that I, it comes up quite a bit, which is don't take anything personal. And I always talk about the book, the four agreements with Don Miguel Ruiz, because yeah. I live by those four agreements. They're very powerful. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, easy read whether you buy the book or do it on audible but that one so many people create their own suffering because they take shit personal all day long so in this particular person's case doesn't get along with their boss real well or new job it's i mean imagine not wanting to go to work every day like dreading that and going to work and hating being at work and then being freaking exhausted from being in suffering all day from work of course you're going to start to have pain and all these other things start to show up. I mean, that's just a natural order of things. Yeah. So again, I had to reframe around the table of her creating some understanding of she's got to stop taking everything personal, that it's not about her when people treat her that way, that that's their reality and that's what they see and it's not hers. And she doesn't need to take that energy on for her own and then suffer with it. And, you know, I struggled with this for most of my life until I was around 32, bud. And then right around 32, I read that book and I just decided that taking things personal didn't serve me in my life and that I needed to make a change in my belief systems about that. And I did it in an instant. Did I have to remind myself for the first couple of months, like, don't take it personal, it's not about you? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. But now I'm at the point where, buddy, I don't take shit personal at all. Somebody wants to be mean to me, treat me a certain way, doesn't bother me at all. And I used to be in suffering for days and hours after people would say things to me or things would happen or I'd go to sleep thinking about them. I mean, how many people do you know that they go to bed and they're running through their day oh, yeah. over things that happen that literally I promised the person that did it to them is not losing any sleep Yeah, because <laughs> it, it wasn't about them, right? Yeah. So the reason I'm bringing this up is, I mean, you were talking about implementation podcasts are great books are great listen to people like us try to help you awesome but if you don't take any of this stuff and make a actual change mm -hmm. and think differently and act differently because you made that change you're yeah. not doing anything mm -hmm. like you're literally just reading stuff and that's about as far as it's going yeah um so i love the way you say it because there is a reward center hit when you make these changes you can feel the chemistry change in you as a person when you make a permanent change of the old person that you used to be or a part of your identity, and then you move into something new. There's an evolution there, and it's very – how would you describe it, man? Well, visceral. It's, it's, it's very visceral, yeah. right? Like yeah. It's like you feel yourself, the chemistry of your body changing, and, it's, and it feels good. Yeah. It's liberating is the best word I can honestly probably say. It's very, very liberating. And and so for our listeners, if you're stuck, there's liberation right there. And it's just a change in mindset and then a consistency after that. And then when you feel the shift and the growth and the behaviors change, it doesn't take that long. And that's the new you. You know, this is how you've done it from the time you were born. You know, I use the example about tying the shoes, right? Mm. Like when you were a kid, you didn't know that you didn't know that you had to tie shoes. You, mm -hmm. When you first saw your parents do it, you're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. And then they were teaching you how to tie your shoe. And then you have to think about it for a while when you tie your shoe. Now, as adults, nobody thinks about it when they tie their shoe. They just put their hands down and they tie their shoe. It's automatic mm -hmm. because you've dialed it into your subconscious. It's no different with what you and me are talking about when you're trying to motivate yourself or make changes in your behaviors and your actions and make a change in your identity. You're changing a belief system about yourself. You start implementing that change daily, right? And then before you know it, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's pretty quick. Yeah. 
So you know? true. It's so but true. you have to think about it for a while, right? Yeah. You have to sure. consciously be active in the change for a temporary period. And it's not forever. Mm-hmm. But, and I think when people listen to that, buddy, they think, oh, that's just so simple. That couldn't be it. No, it is it. It is that simple. You're just changing the wiring of, of how you behave and you act. Mm-hmm. But there has to be some work there at the front end and some conscious control of it. And then eventually it's just dialed in. But every habit that you have now in behavior, you've already done this. Yeah. You've already been doing the exact framework I'm actually explaining. It's just when you have to be conscious of it, there's a little bit of resistance at the front end. But I mean, it goes quick, man. It really does. Well, well, think about how much learning happens when we're young, to your point of the shoe tying. Like, how many of us have just, you know, resided to the fact that most of our learning is done and, like, we're not really trying to learn anymore. It's just like we want things to be easy. We want things to be habit. And and it's a struggle to learn new things. But, but like, and I should say, you, you hit on something earlier, and I love that you shared that because I think this is so impactful, and that is the concern of what, we feel of other people imparting on us or like um, making making other people's opinion of us the priority over how we feel about ourselves. Like we care about ourselves so deeply and yet we care more about what other people think about us. And that is huge, man. Like uh, I often think about just, you know, the the degree to which we we feel that pain from another is just our agreement to consenting to it like we've accepted and invited it in because we're we're choosing to 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 continuously experience that pain and beautifully said man. yeah and we're making that an obstacle to our own healing we're putting so much emphasis on the other person that we've neglected that that self-love by by giving that that a yeah, that worry about an opinion of us uh, so deeply we put it on that other person and I, th- I think about this often with regards to judgment because you know our our ability to see ourselves is really like unfortunately uh you know um a byproduct of how we think that other people see us and so we're we're not even seeing ourselves like so our identity is so wrapped up in what other people think about us that we're not even taking time to really honor who we really are or you know, who we are going to choose to be, you know, going back to that idea of, of change. So, you know, I think you hit on, a, we'll have to riff on, on another podcast, just on this kind of concept of um, letting go, because there is a sticky point for me, for sure. I can let go of like, you know, and it's been hard for me because I deeply do care what people think about me. And that's always been, um, you know, a, a vulnerability of me that that I've come to learn uh, how to uh, adapt to more. It's been a challenge for sure, but where where I still find it challenging is those that that you deeply love. And so, if you feel hurt from your partner, I mean, my kids, I, I sort of brushed off because I know that they love me, and and they, yeah, they say some hurtful things sometimes, but I, I don't I don't linger in it. But it's it's when it's it's Sonia, like if she pushes my buttons in a certain way. I'll definitely take that to heart in a bigger way. And and that's part of my journey at this point in time. I feel like I've done a good job of not letting the the environment or most of the people in my life, I'm not letting that uh, affect me. But Sonia still, it can be a trigger. And, and I think that's going to happen to the people that you closely love. And just before you jump in, because I know you, you got some important stuff to stay on this, is that where where this really matters is that this can unfold such deep conversations with your loved ones and it's such an opening to go like wow like i really felt hurt by by what was said there and like it's not about you it's about like this wounding that you that you show, showed me through you know how you how you treated me or what you said and whatever it stirred inside me so it becomes such a wonderful opportunity that I'm really starting to enjoy now. Like, I, obviously, I don't like arguing with, with Sonia or having any disagreement. But man, it opens up this amazing stream of communication that I just would we just wouldn't get without that that adversity. So, yeah. Well, it's the vulnerability, that? right? Well, it's your vulnerability. Yeah. You, you know, there's conflict there. If something is said with your wife. And instead of getting pissed and like having that negative self-talk and like, man, eh, whatever, like some people do you open the door of vulnerability and you connect with your partner and go deeper there to see what's there. Right. And not a lot of people will actively do that. They just brush it off. Um, 
But I, I love what you just spoke to, man, because it, it, it's something that we all struggle with, right? Like pretty regularly. And I think if, and we'll have to really hit home on all this last part, because it's like another talking point. I could go on for like a half hour with you. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one of those things what we all suffer with, man, but the ability to make these changes and have conscious control of these changes literally just comes from taking an active role and not a passive role. And I feel like so many people are passive with things like this mm -hmm. and they don't allow this to happen. They're just passive. And it's because they're out here. They're not inside, they're outside. And all this work has to be done on the inside, right? It can't be done on the outside. Mm -hmm. It just can't. And you know, even things like you're talking about, like with little bits with our kids or with our wives, and you've you've said this. I've learned this from you actually. Is like we had a conversation with somebody, and they said like if you talked to people like you talk to yourself, you wouldn't have any friends. I don't remember right. who told us. Or that, you you wouldn't like, choose to ever have them as your friend. You, you right? wouldn't hang yeah. out with them if you yeah. talked to you like you the self talk you talk to yourself. If you talked like that to other people, and think about how you talk to yourself. Mm -hmm. That creates a stress response, just like when you're thinking of somebody else or something else happening. If you're talking negatively to yourself or having negative self-talk, all you're doing is bashing yourself like somebody else is bashing you. Mm -hmm. I mean, people need to understand that. So be very, very careful with how you think about yourself and the thoughts that you have. You can't control your feelings, but you can control your thoughts. Definitely. And so that self-talk is very key, man. Be impeccable with your word, not just outwardly, but inwardly. And that's another one of the four agreements, man. Totally. It's like be impeccable with your word, not just what's coming out, but also what's coming in. Yeah. I mean, it has such a huge influence even on what we're talking about, this self-motivation to get started, self-started. Because most of those people, when they're in suffering, it's all negative. Yeah. All negative. And I believe... I'm at this place in life now, brother. You have to love yourself more than you love anybody else. You can't truly love somebody else to the degree that you would want to if you don't have m more than that love for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that at this point in my life. You can't. You can't do it. I mean, That's think about that fun. from a heart-centered place. Yeah. If you don't fully love yourself, like to the most deeply piece of who you are, how can you show up and love somebody else? Mm -hmm. And you and me are very over caring individuals, right? Like we yep. talked about that briefly last time. And there's nothing wrong with that. There, I mean, there's downsides if we don't have conscious control of it. Mm -hmm. So I get it. What you're, you know, I completely get what you're telling me. Like, wife says something, a patient says something. But the reality there, man, is, is like, because we care that much, we're always engaged in in, in, in other people, mm -hmm. which which is great. That's what we signed up for in this lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. But to do that, we have to love ourselves unconditionally, right? And so I think that's a big piece, man. Yeah, I love it. And it, it takes us back to, you know, if we were to take that on, you know, everything that we discussed today, then, then we would love ourselves enough to really anchor in that new identity that we're, that we're becoming, you know, yeah. the fulfillment of our potential and to move beyond our suffering and to, to see that the suffering is, is our opportunity for healing so much more. Absolutely. Right. Self-realization. Well, and you want to live a life to where suffering doesn't have to take place to mm. get there. And yeah. so many people, that's the reality. They're not living life. Something bad happens, creates a lot of suffering. And that's what finally wakes them up to get them and to move and to grow and evolve into that next chapter. So take an active role for our listeners. Don't wait for something bad to happen in your life. You know, in my early 30s, I just decided to take an active role in all these things. And I spent a decade working on myself. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten so addicting that I just keep going, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you can't do it nonstop just for people who are listening. You kind of have to go in there, do a little work and then jump out and live life for a little while. And then go yeah, back in there, do a little work and then jump out and live life for a while. You can't totally. be in there all the time. But yeah, yeah and it's adaptation and integration, right? Like yes. when you're stepping back out, it's, it's you. Okay. I'm going to apply this to life. I'm going to integrate. 
Yeah. And then I'm going to dive back in and learn more. Yeah. You can't go to the gym and do biceps, you know, 500 times and then feel like you're going to be fine the next day. It's yeah. no different with emotional work. You can't do all this emotional work 24 seven and expect totally. there won't be negative repercussions. I know people that do way too much soul work, like yeah. way, way too much. Yeah. And they're a effing mess. Yeah. <laughs> on and off throughout the year because they don't know how to like slow down yeah. and like let adaption and integration take place. Yeah. And it's, they're like addicted to their own shit. They like totally. this chaos. Yeah. They just keep like, they like to try to keep evolving, but you can do too much of that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Buddy, what a great episode. It was so fun, yes. ch- you know, chatting with you on this, these topics. This is like, this is solid gold, like for, for me to hear and, and no doubt for anyone who's actively in it, but also for people to do a little self-assessment, like where am I at? Like, I mean, what, yeah. what, have, what have I, what have I brought into my life? Where am I stuck? And so brilliant well, brother, conversation. The thing I love about the whole conversation is we're talking about severe cases, but this applies to everybody. Yep. This is just to make changes, like a change. When you know a change is needed to be made, this is the tools that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. That's it. Brilliant. Yeah. Love you, man. Love you too, brother. We'll see you next week. Awesome, brother. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.